happens when a 50-year-old law meets the modern world. Today, we're unpacking the latest twist with Title IX protections and gender identity. Welcome back to Beyond the Build Number. Today, we're diving into a topic that's got everyone talking. From school board meetings to the halls of Congress, gender identity and how it relates to the protection of women and girls in education is on people's minds. There's a new Joint House Resolution 165 causing quite the stir, and we're here to break it all down. Stephen, ready to untangle this web? Let's do it. We're talking about Title IX, and Title IX might be from the 1970s, but it is still shaping debates uh, on issues like this today. So where shall we start, Sarah? Let's kick off today with some history on Title IX. So Title IX refers to Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. It states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied in the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Sounds pretty straightforward. And remember, back then, the word sex was, in this context, very uncontroversial. It was just a, a word that people used, and it was not going to invoke any kind of <laughs> response from people. That's right. And Originally, this was all about ensuring that no one was excluded from educational programs based on their sex, which means making sure that girls and women had a fair access to education and that girls in sports had their sports funded at the same rates of boys. And so, you know, when we look back, this was very much about trying to bring women forward from, you know, a society that mm. did very much value and invest in males more than females and then moving mm -hmm. towards, um, you know, trying to protect that. This protection was then expanded to cover sexual harassment, sexual assault in the 90s, which again was another movement of our society forward, recognizing that there's more things mm -hmm. that we need to be investing in, protecting from, those kinds of things. And then during the Obama administration, it was expanded again to protect trans students from discrimination. And Stephen, What's the core issue with the resolution that we're talking about today as it relates to Title IX? Well, yes, yeah, so Title IX on the face of it is, is quite a simple thing. It's about protecting women, um, but the, the, there are political differences on this. But one of the, the key political differences is, is now around this definition of sex and the fact that it was expanded to cover uh, sort of gender effectively and uh, when people are changing their gender as well, which obviously people on the right tend to disagree with, most people on the left tend to support. So um, the Obama administration administration brought in these changes through a variety of different rules and, and sort of guidance and so on around Title IX. Uh, and the Trump administration, of course, then rolled it back uh, as soon as they could. Um, uh, and in fact, they went further than that. Rather than just rolling back changes, uh, they actively stated that um, cisgender athletes' rights were actually being infringed by transgender athletes, athletes if they were all sort of also competing. So uh, sort of very much uh, a step back. Uh, and obviously all schools and, and um, educational organisations had to sort of get to grips with that. Uh, but then, of course, uh, Obama lost the, <laughs> lost the election. Uh, in comes Biden. And the Biden administration then set about changing that. So um, they started straight away with a couple of um, sort of different rules that they introduced. Uh, and in particular, uh, back in April 2024, uh, the Department of Education then issued uh, this sort of very important rule uh, that flipped the definition back again to include <laughs> protection for gender identity, sexual orientation. And it also included uh, sort of... Um, a, a, a more a sort of advanced stuff around sexual harassment and sexual assault as well, basically making it easier for uh, women and girls to bring um, sort of challenges to, to, to men that they thought had assaulted them or harassed them in any way. So the resolution that we're talking about today, um, the House Joint Resolution 165, wants to roll that back again to basically put things back to the way they were uh, under the Trump administration. So uh, it's one of those sort of frustrating examples where uh, every time government changes or sort mm -hmm. of the, the political colour of the government changes. Everyone seeks to flip things back to the way it was last time they were in power as well. Whereas actually what people really need in these sort of spaces is uh, a bit of stability. You want to know what the <laughs> rules are uh, for years and years and years and you just operate those rules and everyone gets familiar with them and and, and you can put in place sort of effective programmes. Yeah, How can you put an effective programme in place if you think, well, next year it's all going to change again? Uh, right. And it all comes down really to 
this definition of what does sex really mean in the context of Title IX. Yeah, it sounds to me like a classic case of who controls the narrative controls the law. And I think that one of the more interesting things is how sex has changed its definition from the 70s to now. And it's considered okay to say your sex assigned at birth um, and you don't say your gender assigned at birth. And so that's, you know, a big movement mm-hmm. from where we used to think of sex as gender. And now it's very much kind of this biological marker. Some folks are saying that this new rule ignores the basic biological facts. What's the argument there? Yeah, so proponents of the resolution uh, will argue that by including gender identity under sex-based discrimination, uh, this rule undermines protection for for women and girls. It's it's effectively uh, degrading what it means to be a woman. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're particularly concerned uh, about issues like transgender women participating in in women's sports and therefore uh, having like a biological advantage because they claim that they are actually biologically male. Um, Mm -hmm. And also using women's facilities, um, which they claim uh, you know it's unfair competition but it also compromises the safety of women in that these spaces are no longer sort of sacrosanct uh, just for women really. This is a view that's contained uh, that's gained a lot of traction recently um, particularly among conservative lawmakers uh, and obviously conservative government governors so it tends to be very much a sort of state by state issue. Yeah and on the flip side opponents of the resolution see things very differently I would say (laughs) and they argue Mm. that this rule is essential to creating a safe environment for all students especially are LGBTQ plus individuals. What are they saying around that? Yes, yeah, so the, the opponents are pushing back very, very hard on this, uh, as you might expect, really, and say the rule is about ensuring that no one is discriminated against, period. So mm-hmm. um, in, in educational settings, just as in other places, uh, tra- trans people are suffering enormous amount of discrimination, and the, this, as the argument goes, and so they need these additional protections, much more so uh, than, than some other people in these settings as well. Um, so protecting LGBTQ LGBTQ plus students from harassment and discrimination uh, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and this does, of course, I- include trans people as well. And the rule helps clarify that Title IX covers these issues and so that these trans people, as well as uh, other people in the LGBTQ plus community, should enjoy equal protections. Um, and they argue that actually rolling back these protections in the way that this uh, resolution wants to do uh, would may actually make schools less safe, particularly for these transgender students who already suffer these very significant risks. Yeah, and I think now is a good time for us to just kind of get into the arguments behind everything. Mm. There's two pretty starkly divided sides and there's not a lot of in between. Either people can kind of wrap their brains around what it is to protect trans youth, trans people, and give them space to exist in the world. There's pieces there that are always going to, you know, fundamentally be a little Mm. uncomfortable, but like some people can just kind of move themselves that way. And then other people just can't move that way. You know, the the basic biological there is is the thing that is driving it. It's even Mm. more interesting with the Olympics happening and and kind of talking about Mm. what people in sports are doing and how we're kind of moving this forward. The uh, example of Imani Khalif, the Algerian boxer at the Olympics is a really, really interesting one. So Imani uh, is a woman uh, and was born a woman has always been a woman, has always lived as a woman, has never uh, had any sort of questions over her gender at all. However, um, she was banned from boxing uh, by um, a sort of a boxing organisation on the grounds that she'd failed a gender test. Now, um, we don't know exactly why she failed that gender test, but it certainly wasn't because she was transgender in any way, because she isn't. Um, uh, it's, it's speculated that, in fact, she has one of these developmental conditions, a hormonal developmental condition, which means she has high uh, elevated levels of testosterone um, so that her body develops in some ways uh, to develop the kind of musculature you might expect on a man but but certainly not developed as a man Uh, and um, the Olympics obviously so hugely supportive they let her compete and so on but there was an enormous furore about the fact that this trans uh, trans uh, woman was being allowed to compete it's completely untrue (laughs) it's completely maligned I think she's taking Mm -hmm. legal action uh, and quite rightly so Um, and uh, you know everybody waded in on this Um, um, and it, it just simply wasn't true. And it shows how, again, this, this arguing about the actual fact rather than arguing about opinions matters. But but she illustrates an important thing that not everybody with uh, two X chromosomes is a woman and not everyone with an XY chromosome are men um, because there is an important second part to that, which is the various hormonal balances that can be different. Uh-huh. So there are all sorts. And there's about 40 different types of conditions that can mean that whether you're a man or a woman is actually a little bit blurred, which is why this, this sort of blanket claim that, 
that there is a biological men and there are biological women is simply not true and most of the time it doesn't matter but when you get to an elite sport and you get to an elite mm -hmm. level like this particularly in a sport like boxing where strength and obviously is very very important then um you know it does become an issue and then the the elite organizations themselves have to draw the line they have to say okay if you've got this amount of testosterone if you're over the line you, yep. you can't compete if you're under the line you can compete but but then what about other people who have biological advantages like michael phelps has ridiculously long arms now yes. you know he's also an amazing <laughs> athlete and worked incredibly hard and deserves every medal he won but at the same time he has unusually long arms which gives him a mm -hmm. massive advantage when he's swimming so should he not be allowed to compete or right. you know usain bolt who has like really long legs should he not be able to compete because yeah that or simone to, right? biles is you know, really short and so, she can yeah, you know, yeah. she's I'm, short she's powerful yeah. one thing that's really perplexing to me is that we've kind of generally agreed that there's some levels of testosterone that's allowable to be identified as a female in competition sport and identified as a male and we have these levels they're doing mm. these tests there's you know the olympic committee has agreed upon this but it's interesting to me because I do feel like there is a kind of common uh, narrative with these athletes where they will say that there was a trans athlete competing and that's why I didn't win, especially with this boxer. The whole entire thing happened because the woman that she was um, boxing against like gave up and forfeited because she said that she was yeah, boxing exactly. a man and it was not fair and like, yep. you know, and she was losing because this woman ended up winning the gold. She just gave up and said it was because of that. And I remember a couple years ago, there was a runner that I think was maybe from Texas and she was saying that there was a trans girl that was running with her and that's why she didn't make states well you do a little bit of research and this woman wasn't even getting in like the top 10 places so like yeah. this one person that was running that was a trans woman was not the person that was like stopping her yeah. from winning podiums and all these things and also you like look at the trans woman's results and they also weren't even doing that well you know like they were just yeah. running it was high school like and so there's all of these things and it's it's interesting because i do feel like a lot of the people that are kind of moving these kinds of arguments for in these ways are also people who are just kind of looking for reasons to not be the, having the success that they think that they deserve mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And, you know, it's like you look at Michael Phelps, like nobody's trying to get Michael Phelps out of anything yeah. because his arms, I think, are taller than I am. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but we can all Absolutely. kind of recognize that if we decided that these are the levels that are acceptable. And um, Title IX is a, it, it's an interesting element to this because uh, it's it's pretty much unique, I would say, to the United States that college sport is so important. Uh, mm -hmm. In most countries, it's just not. I mean, in the UK, if you were good at sport, you wouldn't go to university to do it, right? You wouldn't yeah. get a scholarship to go to university because you're good at a sport. That's just not the way it works. You know, sport at university is just very much a friendly amateur thing, mm -hmm. um, and so you wouldn't get these kind of issues arising in in uh, right. in UK universities. I think it's in most countries. But in America, of course, it's very important because college sport is is the route to to becoming professional and to really getting on. Isn't or it? the route to getting um, an education because our education here is so expensive mm, and you want a scholarship. Absolutely. <laughs> So we've got a classic clash of perspectives here, protecting women's spaces versus ensuring non-discrimination for all. But let's get practical. If this resolution passes, what's the real world impact? Well, if uh, House Joint Resolution 165 makes it into law, uh, it would nullify the uh, April 2020 referral rules. So schools wouldn't have to follow the expanded definition of sex-based discrimination, which is a little bit unusual. People understand how resolutions work. We'll, we'll know that resolutions are generally just saying uh, they're expressing an opinion on behalf of the legislators. They don't have a legislative impact, but that's not necessarily true. Some can, particularly joint resolutions can. And this is an example where uh, it would actually wipe out this rule. Um, and that would mean then um, that educational institutions across the country would may well roll back protections for transgender students uh, and potentially revive some of the Trump era sort of title title nine policies and so on. Uh, and then let's just remember here, it's important to remember that the DRA rule isn't totally or isn't mainly about transgender rights. It is about a whole raft of different things that are designed to protect women. So a big part of it uh, seeks to make it simpler for women to bring forward allegations of sexual harassment, sexual abuse and so on. And so if you nullify this rule, all that goes as well. But 
politically, this is much more about drawing battle lines because it, it's very unlikely to pass the, the Democrat-controlled Senate or, in fact, survive a presidential veto. Um, but it does set the stage for the 2024 election and beyond. And one other really interesting piece about this, and I think that we've even showcased this on our own <laughs> podcast right now, is how pervasive of an issue the trans issue is in our society that we've spent essentially the entire time talking about what it means to be trans, mm-hmm. where trans people are allowed to exist, yep. and we're not talking about any of this sexual harassment and <laughs> abuse part of this. You're just so distracted and focused on this huge raging debate. And- All right, so that aside, um, it's less about kind of an immediate change and more about messaging for this next election cycle and and the narrative that we're speaking. So speaking of the future, I hear this ties into Project 2025. What's that all about? So yeah, I mean, we've spoken a lot about Project 2025, which we say is is like the playbook for future Trump administration. Though, of course, Trump and his team uh, do now deny that. So uh, that itself is uh, sort of a point of contention. Uh, But Project 2025 includes a plan to sort of revisit and potentially roll back all of these recent changes to Title IX. Uh, It includes redefining sex strictly as your biological sex at birth. So it's basically setting the scene for this resolution not passing. And then um, following the election, uh, if you have a Conservative president, then the Conservative president would actually make these changes anyway. Um, And also there's another little bit of it, which is to say that they would also roll back these uh, sort of expanded ways for um, women to bring sexual harassment, sexual assault charges as well, because they feel that it goes a little bit too far uh, hmm. in terms of not protecting the uh, the uh, protecting the accuser rather than protecting the accused so uh, hmm. there, there's sort of a bit of an issue there as well well you hate to see that <laughs> seems a little <laughs> bit like we're setting up a chessboard for 2025 and we'll definitely have to keep an eye on this one so thanks Stephen, for breaking it down and as always the legal landscape around title nine is anything but boring <laughs> Absolutely, Sarah. And to to our listeners, stay tuned. Uh, So this issue isn't going away anytime soon, but we'll always be here to help you navigate the twists and turns. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.